Okay, you ready? Here we go. I'm 14 years old and I'm jumping on the trampoline at the gym. Ever since I was with eight, this used to be my happy place, my playground. Part of my DNA was actually rubber ball. There's just nothing I like better than bouncing and spinning and twisting and flipping. And then when I was 12, I started to compete. All of a sudden it was all like toes pointed, legs straight, stick the landing, toes pointed, legs straight, stick the landing. I started working out two to three hours a day and on weekends I'd be at meets and I just started to feel more and more pressure to win. My playground had become a proving ground. So here I am at the gym, I'm bouncing away, and I'm working on a twisting flip. So I'm trying to get as high as I can, up, 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 and then I whip myself around, but I don't flip. So I come down, boom, on my head. I wake up in the hospital with a broken neck. Doctors tell me that I'm lucky not to be paralyzed, but that my gymnastics career is over. You know, once I come home after a week in the hospital and I'm recovering in bed and I come out of shock, I start to grasp my situation and I realize that it's actually okay. In fact, I'm kind of relieved. No more trying to get my bow-legged knees to touch. No more knots in the pit of my stomach the night before a meet. No more pressure to win. But I am still stuck in bed, so, and that's pretty miserable. So my mother brings me a big bag of clay, and I scoop out big fistfuls, and I start to make things. I make these three-dimensional pointy star-like things and paint them bright colors, and I call them miracles. I make hundreds of them. Everybody who visits me receives a miracle. But the real miracle is that I feel alive and free again. I have a new playground in my imagination and creativity. So five years later, it's the summer of my sophomore year in college, and I hear about this dream job. It's an amazing, like, once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I think there's no chance I'm going to get it. So, well, okay. I figure I'll give it a shot. So I build this blue puppet, crochet it, and I put it in a box with a letter as if it's applying for the job. It says, hello, I'm Clyde, I'm here to work. When do I start? Rack? I get an interview, we get an interview, and a week later I get the call, oh my God, we got the job. I'm 19 years old, I moved to New York, and start working for Sesame Street. I can't believe my life. I mean, I get to make something wacky every single day. A chorus of singing bananas, a basketball court for a worm, a nose flute for Snuffleupagus, a band of beetles that sings, letter B, letter B, letter B, letter B. For real. The Muppet Workshop is in the, the gorgeous wake workshop space. It's like the sunniest, most beautiful atrium space. It's the crown of the Muppet headquarters and the highlight of any tour. One day I'm, I'm working on a pre pressing glue through a hot glue gun, making cheese for a Muppet pizza. And I look up, and there's Michael Jackson going, wow, that's amazing. I have to pinch myself to make sure I'm not dreaming. I mean, I don't feel like I'm working. I feel like I'm having fun and getting paid for it. The next year, the Muppet Take Manhattan movie comes out, and it's a smashing success, which makes the demand for, a project, for products explode. So the licensing department grows, and it expands, it needs more space. So the workshop has to move out of our beautiful sunny headquarters into this dingy gray box across town. It's like fluorescent lights and cockroaches. So 
here we are, we're packing our boxes and it feels like a funeral, like banished to the sweatshop of gloom. We stop getting visitors and we just start getting memos instead and lots of paperwork, tons of paperwork. All of a sudden I get that knot in the pit of my stomach again and I feel like toes pointed, straight legs, stick the landing. Once again, my playground has become a proving ground. So today, I want to share with you why it is so vitally important that we restore our playgrounds and the four miracles that I found that made that possible. Why are we even talking about this? Because 200 years of the Protestant work ethic has us believing that play is a frivolous pastime, the opposite of work, and a distraction from serious business. So playful spirits are getting bumped out of beautiful sunny atrium spaces and smashed into boxes every single day. And we take it for granted, like it's just part of growing up or the cost of success. But we're wrong. It couldn't be more wrong or opposite. In fact, recent advances in uh, play research have literally turned the work ethic on its head and taken a look inside. And here's what they see. Play actually grows brains. Neuroscientists have found that rats who are play deprived have brains that are 20 to 30 percent smaller than the playful rats. You can actually see on brain scans what a half hour of play looks like. There's actually nothing that produces as many positive emotions as play. You get love, joy, excitement, contentment, optimism, wonder, awe, everything. And we now know that this cocktail of endorphins benefits every area of our lives. Our immune systems, our creativity, problem-solving skills. Seniors who were play deprived, they were found they had a greater health risk than smoking and obesity. But this is just the top of the iceberg. Play's benefits are so vast, cognitively, physically, emotionally, and socially, that it's like they're a superfood. I call it the kale of behavior, but some people don't like kale, so you can, you know, call it blueberries if you want. But you know, even this metaphor that it's a superfood is actually misleading. It makes it sound like play is just really, really good for you, when actually our survival depends on it. I mean, the play drive is actually located deep in the primitive brain, alongside with sleeping and breathing. If you were to make a list of breathing's benefits, it'd be at least this long. So every survival instinct is a superfood. And while we may be able to hold our play longer than we can hold our breaths, eventually we will perish. We will fail to thrive. As Stephen Jay Gould said, sloppiness, broad potential, quirkiness, unpredictability, and above all, massive redundancy, the key is flexibility, not precision. That's what evolution consists of. In other words, it plays. That's how we got an invisible gas, hydrogen, to turn into the Milky Way galaxy. That's broccoli over there, bulldog, and an iPhone in just 13.7 billion years. Not straight legs, pointed toes, and stuck landings, but big messes, extravagant experimentation, and unbounded free play. And yet, we're squeezing it out of our lives at an alarming rate. Children are working 10 and a half hour days. They play an average of 11 hours a week. And w adults are even worse. According to Harvard Business School survey, 94% of professionals work at least 50 hours a week. Half of them work more than 65 hours a week. I mean, this is crazy. We're wired for play. Our survival depends on it. So why are we paving over the playground at such an alarming rate? Attachment theory is one of the most widely accepted frameworks for understanding human development. And it tells us, it, it gives us a good clue about what's going on. It tells us that our well-being boils down to one fundamental thing. The security we experience emotionally with the 
caretakers in our life, key relationships during the first few years of our lives. Nothing is more important than that connection. It determines not only our health, but how we see the world as a whole, our worldview. If we got consistent emotional support, then we're likely to experience a world that's full of opportunities and playmates and adventures. But if that support was less reliable, we're likely to see life as a perpetual test where we have to constantly earn our security and approval through achievement or status. And if, in a more extreme case, we, our caregivers were absent or unsafe, then we're likely to see life as being full of threats that we have consistently protect and defend ourselves from. So we play to the extent that we feel held and safe. If we aren't playing, it's because we don't feel safe. So attachment wounds aren't just limited to individuals. Societies have them too. So even if we got the benefit of a secure base, we're likely to grow up in a society that's disconnected and just breeds insecurity. But here's the good news. There's a counter trend. We're now seeing more and more books come out that feature the benefits of play. A lot of them bestsellers. I counted recently 200, no, over 250 adult coloring books on Amazon.com. And play is also a big theme in business, especially Silicon Valley. We now know that ping pong table sales are an index for the health of the tech economy. <laughs> so we're starting to get it. Play, good. But let's face it, dropping a ping pong table in a culture that's cutthroat and full of fear is not gonna suddenly turn it into a joyous playground. But the real problem is it's not just that we don't play enough. It's that we get caught in the insecure achievement mindset of the proving ground, and just playing more isn't going to get us off of it. So, what will? Is it even possible in the pressures of modern life? Luckily, thank goodness, it is. Just try to imagine being the spiritual leader of a country that's going through cultural genocide. Everyone's looking to you for spiritual guidance, and still having joy and peace in your heart and nothing to prove. I've heard the Dalai Lama a few times, and I never forget, <laughs> I never remember what he says, but I never forget his giggle. And he's one example, but there are many. In fact, almost all the spiritually mature people I know are playful. Their playfulness is an expression of their freedom, which comes from a deep sense of security and safety, which is something I don't have much of, certainly in my 20s and 30s. After I leave Sesame Street, I work on one creative project after another, and every single one of them starts out full of excitement and possibilities, but eventually, they all become these grueling grinds. I seem to have this special gift of turning possibly the funnest projects in the world into stress traps. I am the luckiest, most miserable person I know. And then it dawns on me that I'm the one bringing the proving ground with me wherever I go. And I look around me, and I see that the world is full of provers and battlers, and that it's not only destroying our lives, it's devastating the planet. So then I become really interested in how to restore playgrounds. And I wonder, if when we're free, we're free to play, then can we also play our way free? Is play both the path and the destination? And if so, how? And this question really grabs my interest. So I set out to learn everything I can about the transformative power of play. I cast my net really wide, and I study, every, study everything from clowning to cosmology, philosophy to theater improv, and here's what I find out. Here's what I learn. I am looking for miracles, and I find four. Rest. If we're going to make play a priority, we have to make rest a priority. Most of us have been proving or battling for decades, 
we're exhausted, more exhausted than we even know. So like one week in bed is a good start, doing absolutely nothing. After I spend a week in bed, I finally start to feel like I got a good night's sleep, which is a miracle. <laughs> but you know, as soon as we start resting, difficult and painful feelings are likely to come up. So miracle number two is welcoming everything. That, I like to think of it as like having big, loving mama arms that are just embracing reality as it unfolds and then hugging me so that I feel safe enough to experience all of it. I mean, that doesn't mean agreeing with or condoning everything, what's happening, definitely not. But it does mean letting it all move through me and not stuffing it away in the box because when we do, our playful spirit goes with it. So when I do let myself feel everything, I feel much lighter and more playful and freer, and that's a miracle. Miracle number three, follow your joy. That just means only doing something if it gives you joy. If I've had a, a proving ground crash, I usually start with the low-hanging fruit, like snuggling with my dog, um, eating mangoes and cashews, or listening to music. And listening to music leads to swaying, which leads to dancing, which leads to dancing like a maniac. It's a miracle. Of course, it's easy when we're not under pressure, but when we are, following your joy means listening carefully to the signals that tell you when to stop, when to take a break, when to, what to eat. Of course, it's hard to hear them sometimes. They can be very quiet, so we have to pay very close attention. This guy, you just saw him, he lives inside my head. So there's no chance I'm gonna hear those signals until he calms down. But once he does, we get the fourth miracle. Practice mindfulness. That means sitting still, letting yourself settle down, and then just bringing awareness to all the thoughts, feelings, and sensations as they arise. Now, I think of this as like the mega, or the mega miracle or the kale of miracles <laughs> because it consists of all the others. It lets you rest deeply. You have more space to welcome everything and it helps you follow your joy. And when you do, that gray box starts to dissolve and you end up in that beautiful, sunny atrium space called the present moment. The present moment is the only doorway to the playground, and it's where all the miracles come from. So I've been in play re rehab for about three years, and let's face it, <laughs> I, it's a slippery slope. I, I mean, this, 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 uh, the TED Talk is like crack for proving ground junkies. Uh, this is like the 27th version of my TED Talk. But it's okay because the whole process of learning and sharing it with others is my new playground. And guess what? You're in it. So let's all wiggle our toes. Come on. Shake your legs. Relax your legs. And let's land gently in this miraculous moment together. Thank you. There we go. <laughs>